Welcome, listeners, to another episode of Expecto Podcastium. As usual, I'm one of your hosts, Mega. I'm Erica, and Jess couldn't make it this episode, so we have a special guest host. We have my good friend, HM. Say hi to everyone. Hello, everybody. I'm Hadkan Zamor. Uh, I'm on Tumblr, which is sort of how I know um, Erica through there. Uh, and Jess, well, I haven't actually met uh, Mega before, but, you know, sort of meet new friends every day kind of thing. So, yeah, I'm here and looking forward to it. I started reading Harry Potter in sort of 2010, 2000, no, 2009, 2010, when I was still at secondary school. Now that's what we have in the UK when you're sort of between the ages of 11 and 16. Um, so, yeah, I was about 14, 15 years old, started reading Harry Potter because I um, went to a bookshop of my parents and I looked saw Philosopher's Stone, which is, you know, the first book. And uh, picked up and started reading it. I thought it was funny, especially Hagrid. Uh, and then I went home, read the whole thing within about a day. Uh, really liked it and read all the other ones. And uh, yeah, then I thought, okay, Ron's my favourite character. And I'm sticking with this. Um, and uh, I didn't really get into the fandom until about 2017 when I went on Tumblr. Yeah, so that's that's my kind of story. HM was my first um, Harry Potter friend. I remember just, uh, he's like the first person that I started talking to on Tumblr. And he was actually the first person I called when I finished Deathly Hallows. It was like, six uh... um, it was, I don't know, sometime in the afternoon for you. And I just, I remember calling you and I was just like a mess of every emotion that existed. Do you remember that? <laughs> Yeah, I remember that. Oh, that was that was something that was, wasn't it? I remember, especially after Malfoy Manor, you were, oh, good grief, when you were reading that. I, remember, I think, didn't you read the whole thing in like 24 hours, like 24 I, hours or something? I read the whole book in six days. Uh, I left my apartment twice. I showered once. I was frustrated about how difficult it was to eat while reading a book. And I read the last third of it in eight hours. Right. I, it was it was like 10 p.m. And I just finished the Green Gods break-in. And uh, I was just like, sleep isn't a thing after that. That's not <laughs> a thing in life. What? No, I, that's uh, not something I can do. Yeah, I remember that. I remember you were like my go-to person when reading Deathly Hallows of because I was uh, I was oh Deathly Hallows was such an amazing ex- oh my god we're gonna have so much fun when we get to Deathly Hallows. I feel like with Deathly Hallows we're probably gonna do like an episode for every chapter. <laughs> oh my probably, gosh, yes. yeah. There's a lot of stuff to cover there. Yeah. Uh, so thanks HM for joining us for this episode. Hopefully it's we'll a pleasure probably- to be here. We'll probably have you on. I know I know you have a few chapters you want to join in for uh, Chamber of Secrets, so it'll be nice to have you on for that. Great. So then, on to the episode. Um, today we're going to talk about chapters 14 and 15. So 14 is Norbert the Norwegian Ridgeback, where we meet Tyra's Jorgen. And then 15 is the Forbidden Forest. So, chapter 14. Chapter 14 is... It's a little, it's not boring. There's just not as much stuff that happens. It's, it's a funny chapter. Just Hagrid with the dragon is just hilarious and amazing. <laughs> and I'm so proud of, of Ron for knowing all the dragon laws. I always, I think in the, in the first book, there's, um, I find, personally, me, I find Ron to be the most developed character out of the three leads. I don't know. I don't know why. I think that's just because he come, he's a lot more. This before um, Rowling started getting a bit more, f- showing a bit more favoritism towards Harry and Hermione. So in this one, Ron kind of is a lot more on board with it, and I think it's also the fact that he's Harry's kind of introduction to the world. So he kind of feels a lot more. He's a lot more engaged, and he's also a lot more. Harry is still quite reserved at this point in time. Whereas Ron is very, still quite sociable. He's, you know, he's come from a big family. He's used to lots of people. And so he's very, very good at this kind of thing. And, um, yeah, it's, just, it's quite nice just seeing the way he interacts with people, especially Hagrid. Like, he, he knows about dragons. He's good at this stuff. And just kind of... And he, I love the way he says, you know, everyone knows about the dragon, you know, the, the dragon breeding. And, you know, what was it? Warlock's Convention of 1709. And it's like, every, people that still think Ron's thick, I mean, it's like, come on. Well, I know it's Chuck, 
it's probably after a childhood with Charlie, but come on, you know, you, that's something, you know, Romney knows his stuff. He knows about this kind of thing. But I just really like that. Yeah, uh, I agree there. I feel like in this in this book, basically, Harry is developing his personality because before this, he didn't really have anyone to show his personality to. Like, he didn't really have mm. any friends, anyone that he trusted, anyone that he could have fun with. So we're basically learning Harry's personality in this book. So I definitely understand what you meant there. But uh, yeah, Ron, knowing the laws, the, knowing the dragon laws, I, I just, I, I know it's not a big deal, but whenever Ron has one of those moments, I just smile because I'm so proud of, of my my beautiful boy. Um, he's mm. a boy now, he definitely becomes a man, but he's a beautiful boy right now. I think you also had a very good point, H and M, about how Harry's like very reserved, and it's Ron the one who's interacting a lot more. Like, I don't, I never noticed this before, but it's really like Ron and Hermione are the ones who are really going back and forth a lot more than Harry is. Mm -hmm. Harry, like, sure, he asks questions and stuff about dragons and stuff to um, Ron and stuff, but it's really Ron who's kind of gently being like, Hermione, calm down. The exams are ages away, and being like, we're not six hundred years old, and like, calm down, and look, these are dragons. And Harry is the very quiet one being like, wait a minute, what's going on here? What's going on? <laughs> so, yeah, I really like that dynamic, you know. I think the um, the later books kind of uh, moved away from that dynamic a lot more, especially uh, from sort of the fourth year onwards. It's a lot more, I think, to a certain extent, Harry, um, like you're saying, he's still kind of, at this point in time, he's still kind of in his show a little bit. Like, even though he is friend, he's got friends now, he's still quite, to a certain extent, reserved. He's holding a little bit back. I don't think he starts to properly come out of his show until second year and, may, and definitely the third year. So at this point in time, he's still quite kind of, I, 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 I don't know, I think someone mentioned it on Tumblr. It's like this idea of Harry's in first year. He's still very, very shy. And I, I like the idea that like, he's always kind of, holding close to Ron because like Ron is like support network kind of thing and there's like you know Ron's the one who's kind of showed him all the friendship and all the rest of it and it's like Aww. it's just it's it's a when I can definitely imagine Harry in first and second year being like that very kind of sort of sort of quietly possessive of Ron to present so like he's never had a friend before so he wants to you know he, he, he that's why he kind of likes Ron is because Ron's always there for him I just think I could like at that age, who wouldn't love a friend like Ron? I mean, any age, who wouldn't love a friend like Ron? So, I just think that's very nice. If you guys hadn't noticed, we really love Ron. <laughs> really Understatement of the century. When, when I, when I, when I, because I was the one that kind of started the podcast. So when I made a post on Tumblr, I made a list of requirements, and one of them was you must like Ron. If you dislike Ron. You will. You have zero chance of being on this podcast. And the other one was you must have realistic opinions of Draco Malfoy, which means <laughs> can, which means canon opinions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not saying you have to hate him. I just mean you have to acknowledge his mistakes and be able to discuss his actions in canon without mm. your canon dream of him. Um, so, but uh, back to chapter fourteen. And then they go visit Hagrid, and they see the dragon egg. And it's like, oh dear, Hagrid, what have you gotten into? Uh, I know. <laughs> this one of my favorite lines, though, which just proves how much I love Hagrid's just positive masculinity is when he calls himself mummy. Um, mm. I can just hear Robbie Coltrane saying that in my head. You know, there's. Yeah, I know yeah. we 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 don't talk. We don't like to talk about the the films too much. But there's certain actors who, when I read their lines in the books, I hear their voices. And one of them is Robbie Coltrane, yeah. and then um, also uh, Alan Rickman and Maggie Smith. But uh, I love that line where he says he he knows his mummy. And then we also, don't we also find out that Norbert's actually a girl later on? Yeah, we do yeah, later on. In, I think it's, yeah, I think it's in Deathly Hallows. We find out that uh, Nor Norbert is actually Norberta. Yeah. Which yeah. I thought it was quite sweet. Yeah. So we'll come back to that. 
Yeah. 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 What I did especially find funny is Hermione's uh, reaction after they found the dragon. She says, Hagrid, you live in a wooden house. <laughs> <laughs> just, oh, I just, I love I, the little lines like that in these, in the first few books. Yeah. Just, it's just, it's, they're really good books to read. You know, just for relaxation, for for leisure, for pleasure, and I think that's that's quite good with these with the first three books, especially, is because they're they're quite short, but they've they've got enough packed in there, and it's just quite a nice book to read. I think that's the little lines like that are just what kind of I don't know. I just really like that the little bits in there that kind of sort of sparkle a little bit like that. I just think I just think that's quite nice. There's more innocence and just um. Uh, not innocence. That's the wrong word to use. Something, something ma- not ma- magical. All the series is magical, but something sort of just whimsy. whimsical. Yeah, whimsical. Yeah. You and your fancy British words there. <laughs> yeah. HM is lives in the UK, so we're gonna we're gonna make fun of all his little British terminologies there. <laughs> yes, we are. I'm honestly not that fancy, to be honest. I'm from the arse end of nowhere. We're still gonna make fun of you. Yeah, <laughs> I know, I know. I, I've I've long accepted this. Now. It's beautiful, though. I love British accents. I love no, beautiful accents. accents. Yeah, we'll uh, I always feel connected to British people just because my grandparents are were from England. Um, I know that's a lot of people's grandparents were from England, but uh, I love England. Oh, <laughs> Really? So I didn't know that. Yeah, going back to the book. Yes, yeah, yeah good. Fun, um, cute lines is later when they're saying that, oh no, they have something else to worry about now. Hagrid raising a dragon in a wooden hut. And Ron says, I wonder what it's like to have a peaceful life. <laughs> <laughs> oh. I feel like looking back on it, Ron probably would have thought, "Wow, I thought that I thought that this was difficult enough." You know, in first year, we're like, "Good grief!" <laughs> like, yeah. "Wow, I did not have an easy childhood." Did I? Yeah. Uh, and we mentioned in another um, episode being like, "These poor children have no idea what they're going to face. This is only their first year. Yeah. They have a lot ahead of them. Yeah, a dragon is the least of their worries." I remember when I when I was um, editing the. Uh, the first uh, Philosopher's Stone um, episode uh, for chapters one to five, we were talking about how Hagrid said, you have to be bloody mad to break into Green Gods. And you're just like, oh, honey, honey, you don't even know what's going to happen yet. <laughs> uh, it's quite funny looking back on it with hindsight, just the little bits from the earlier books where they sort of, hint at things and then suddenly they end up sort of coming back later on yeah. in some kind of way that you didn't expect or like oh no this is like the worst thing ever you know can you imagine like four students being out of bed you've lost so many points and then by the end of it they're like we don't care we <laughs> really do not care anymore we just House skipped the points. last year Hogwarts you know who cares How no. points are, are become a very low priority for them <laughs> But uh, yeah, we, we we talk about all the little the little Easter eggs that you don't know are Easter eggs until after. The the biggest one for me that always comes into my head is uh, the locket being mentioned in Order to Feed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but yeah. we keep getting sidetracked. This is what happens when there's new people on the podcast. Is so, we... no. This happens anyway. Yeah, it's true. It's, that's what's so much fun is just like talking about all this. Yeah. This proves to you guys that we are not like scripting anything. We just kind of blurt out stuff and talk. <laughs> <sighs> yeah. Another thing I noticed um, in this chapter is that uh, Hermione uh, at this point, she's still very kind of bossy to a certain extent. I kind of like it's. It's nice that in sort of the earlier books, it's made clear that you know she's you know she's very kind of intense and bossy and all the rest of it and you know there's nothing particularly wrong with that but i think it's quite funny the way she will just nag harry like at this point like she does act, act like an older sister even at this point like she's going we've got lessons we'll get in trouble and there's nothing to what harry's going to be in if someone finds out what we're doing and harry's like shut up <laughs> <It's just> like, <laughs> harry like, oh, telling, these children harry telling anyone to shut up is amazing he does it so often if you hadn't noticed he is so often telling people to shut up it's like <laughs> i love it so much 
<laughs> oh, another line that I love that Hermione said here um, is, uh, Malfoy's got detention. I could sing. Um, when I read that, I thought for a second it was Harry, but then I realized it was Hermione, and I was like, that's amazing. <laughs> Hermione doesn't say, like, when Hermione says things like that, it's always fun, at least in, mm -hmm. in the earlier books, because she's a little bit more, like, uptight. Um, so when she says things like that, it always kind of just makes you smile, because she is her kind of, like, like, like we all said, coming out of her shell. Like, this one is totally, this book establishes the characters and each of their flaws and strengths so it's uh one of those moments there where she she said i could sing um the thing that comes into my head is old mary remini where hermione starts singing and runs like you're so bad at singing but i could kiss you anyways oh i'm sure he does i'm sure he does <laughs> <laughs> oh but i think it's also really interesting how even in the first way you can see how these three characters are like affecting each other like, I think it was in, what, like, Deadly Hollows when Ron has that line being like, I don't think we're a good influence on Hermione. And so you can tell from the beginning, like, even the Sorcerer's Stone. <laughs> that was Order of the Phoenix. Uh, Order of the Phoenix, all right. Oh, no. I it books made... as well as I should. Actually, it may have been this book. Oh, or I made... think, it's, yeah, it was Maybe some... Maybe multiple times. Yeah. But at the end of the day, yeah. you can tell they're it's influenced by each other. And it's great how early it comes up and how, like, close they are all are. And how, like, your friends really do change you. They do. Yeah. Um, so is there anything else on Chapter 14? Or should we move to 15? Oh, oh I've actually got uh, one thing. Um, uh, Charlie's letter to Ron. Yeah. Because we never actually... I really like this because we never actually hear much about Charlie at all. Like, we only he only appears briefly in... You know, for a little bit in Goblet of Fire, and then yeah. later on in the um in Deathly Hallows. So we never really get any instances where he interacts with Ron at all. But weirdly enough, this is actually the first time we see uh, Ron interacting with one of the two older brothers. We don't hear about Bill at this point. Um, we've heard about him, but you know, he's not really been there. But this is the first time you know we hear about Charlie. And, you know, he's got dragon tamers and all the rest of it. But I just thought it was quite nice that he was. You know, he says he's very kind of caring, considerate towards Ron. I just think I, I quite like that. I think it kind of shows that, you know, not all of Ron's sub older siblings seem to find him really annoying. Like, Charlie does generally seem to care about him quite a bit. And I, I, it's probably just my own little headcanon, but I like the idea that Charlie was kind of the Ron's sort of closest brother growing up because they both have quite similar personalities and they're quite relaxed and chilled. I don't know. I just, I just thought that was quite a nice little bit sort of showing their sort of relationship like that. I just thought that was really sweet. I love how in his in Charlie's letter to Ron, the first thing he says is "How are you?" That mm. smile there. I mean, it's. I think most people would do that when you're sending a letter to your your sibling or something. But I just I love how that's his first concern is how's Ron doing. Um, but mm. I totally agree with you. Of of all of the Weasley, uh, all the Weasley children, we don't we don't see a lot of Charlie. So you know, little interactions like that are always sweet. Um, I. I've always felt, I think, I've never really thought too much about Ron's relationship with Charlie, but now that you mention it, it's, I, I, I can see Ron looking up to Charlie when he was younger, but I definitely think that after Deathly Hollows, his closest brother uh, is Bill. And maybe, mm -hmm. maybe George develops as, you know, things heal and stuff like that, but... Uh, mm -hmm. I definitely think that Deathly Hallows changed Ron's relationship with Bill for in a good way. But, yeah. yeah. I agree, yeah. And the whole, like, Ron helping out George and, like, Wizards, Weasley, the, the shop and everything, they, they definitely would have felt closer. But, yeah, I really love this letter as well. I, I, I've always wanted to know what Ron's letter to Charlie was. And, like, I, I want to know, like, how... Like, was this, like, a normal thing where Charlie was just... Because Charlie was just so on board immediately to, like, take this dragon. There was, like, no questions, you know? It was like, oh, okay, there's a dragon? Cool, I'm gonna... Like, well, we'll figure out a way to take it. I want to know, like... Did Ron just spend a long time convincing him? Like, was it just, like, a normal thing that happened, you know, between them? Um, and I, I really do love how... You can tell that Ron does look up at Charlie because how interested he is in the dragon. Like, from the very beginning, when he's looking at the egg, he's like, this must have cost a fortune. Like, where'd you get this, Hagrid? And, like, oh, my gosh, when, is the, when do you think we're ever going to see a dragon hatching again? Ron is, like, immediately fascinated by dragons. And you can tell, like, that's probably 
comes from Charlie, which is really sweet. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree there. Uh, totally yeah. forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> I do that all the time, don't worry about it. Yeah. Yeah. Charlie's like a fair amount older than Ron though, right? Like, I remember now. Much older. Uh, yeah, just, sorry, off to you, Erica, Karen. I I love how like Charlie is doesn't even he doesn't even mention how this is like so not allowed. He's just like, oh, I'd love to help. I always think that um, Charlie and Hagrid had a good relationship. That's mm, the only thing I think yeah. of just because you know animals and and things like that. So I think I just I loved how the first Charlie doesn't even mention like, oh, you shouldn't have been doing that. He's just like, yeah, I'll help. Let's get this. Let's get this little guy. You know. Yeah, and speaking of Charlie and Hagrid's relationship, I don't think that is would be a good one because when we go back to when we see Hagrid and Charlie interacting in Goblet of Fire, they seem like on pretty good terms. Um, like when when um, Charlie brings the dragons and Hagrid sneaks out to see them with Madame Maxine. We'll get to that eventually mm. down the road after lots and lots of podcast episodes. But <laughs> <laughs> they come back and they're definitely interacting and they seem pretty friendly with each other. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we hear that um, we hear later on in the books that um, I think it was in third year that Percy mentions that Charlie took care of magical creatures. Uh, now Hagrid obviously wasn't teaching them at that point, but it does. He does Percy does say that Charlie's already an outdoorsy type, so I mean, it's not you know he could have easily could have ended up just hanging around Hagrid and doing all the rest of it. And the Weasleys clearly know Hagrid before this because uh, when uh, Ron first meets Hagrid, you know when he goes, they go into, down to for tea with Hagrid um, <laughs> Hagrid says something like what was it I'd spend half my time chasing your twin brothers away from the forest <laughs> it's like oh gosh Ron's having to deal with like this stuff from all of his siblings already but I just I think it's 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 nice that you know they all sort of fit, know each other fairly well even though you it's not sort of obvious but you still got these kind of other character interactions going on like you Charlie and Hagrid have clearly met before they know each other all the rest of it I just think that's quite nice and I feel like, yeah, a big part of these books, as we mentioned this in the first episode and stuff like that, is, like, the community around us and, like, nostalgia and, like, how much these books meant to all of us. And that's, like, a whole another unique... Like, the books are great, but it's, like, how much they mean to us and how much we feel about them and, like, think about them and how, like, how much we think... Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. that's a whole other thing. Which makes these ser- this series, like, a step above, like, every other series I've ever read. I totally know what you mean, especially as someone who got into the fandom so much later than most people do. It's I I look at it and I just think honestly how much join becoming part of this has changed my life because it's been two years since I started since I got Philosopher's Stone. So it's it's you saying something like that just makes me think literally how just deciding to read these books has honestly changed a whole part of my life. So it, it's, it's so true. It means a lot to me. And I'm, I wish I would have gotten into this so much sooner. But you're here now. Yeah. Do you want to talk about McGonagall and their detention and like how he, he treated them and stuff? That was McGonagall. Oh, McGonagall. I just, she, she's such a well-written character. She's, she's, the, her role is just so, not role, I feel like that's the wrong word to use, but she, she's an important figure in that she's, she's one of the most fair teachers in the whole series. Fair in that she doesn't play favorites, she doesn't look and look at, like, she doesn't stereotype the houses. Like she'll she'll take points from Gryffindor. She won't just take points from Slytherin because she doesn't like Slytherin. And, but but when we do get those moments where she we see her her little personality, that's always sweet. Like mm. like there's there's multiple times where they mention her giggling. I love that. <laughs> um, but um, her freaking out at them makes complete sense. Honestly, like if you think about it, what they yeah. did was like oh, yeah. pretty crazy. Well. Yeah. At that time, when you think At about that point. what they've done, but you know, so far that's pretty crazy what they did. 
I love the image I'm... of McGonagall wandering around in a tartan bathrobe and a hairnet, grabbing Malfoy by the ear and like lugging around yelling at him. And yeah. then yelling at go. What I always uh, found quite interesting was um, Hermione gets a detention before Ron does. <laughs> like in, in, when they're at school, Hermione is the <laughs> Hermione and Harry get detention. Ron doesn't get get one until the next year. I just I can't imagine how many <laughs> how joyous that must make Ron feel. Like when he gets to tell his kids, you know, they're saying, "Oh, when did when did you first get your tennis set?" Well, he said, "Well, I was the responsible one. I didn't get one until the second year." But your mother on the other hand took an illegal dragon out to the part of the castle and got a detention from it from McGonagall and lost fifty points for Gryffindor. And the parents are just like all the other sort of parents around them are just like, "What?" And the kids are just like, "Huh?" And Hermione's just going bright red <laughs> with embarrassment. I just love that much limit so much. The only thing here is this is the only time that Hermione gets detention in the entire book series, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Maybe. We'll, we'll, we'll yeah. have to double check that, but in, this is one of... It's, it's just funny. Uh, mm. I just imagine her just freaking out about, like, I can just imagine being in Hermione's head um, like her head just being like, oh my god, this means I'm gonna fail my owls. I won't be able to finish Hogwarts. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, you know, fail. It's just, oh my god, I just, I imagine being in Hermione's head. Uh, I feel like I always think that Hermione actually has a lot of anxiety, but she keeps it inside. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think Hermione is somebody who kind of she worries that if she doesn't do really, really well, she'll get booted out of the wizarding world and not let back in. I think that's. She does a lot of her actions, especially when it comes to like following rules in the early years, does come a time to that. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, going on to the next chapter, because that's a nice segue. Like, she literally, like, the text literally said that Hermione was trembling when they were going mm-hmm. to, when Phil was taking down to McGonagall. Like, Harry was trying to think of, like, excuse me, and Hermione was just trembling. And she did mm-hmm. seem completely and utterly terrified. Mm-hmm. It was like, poor first year Hermione, like, before she really got used to all these rule breaking and like really let loose mm. <laughs> she got her one detention yep i also yeah. find it interesting that um sorry if we're just cutting back very quickly yeah. but uh um when apparently you know, so they say from being one of the most popular admired people at the school harry was suddenly the most hated um because of all the you know the house points and all the rest of it and then it says only ron stood by him I don't know why, but that small line always gets me. I kn- yeah. I think it's just because I love Ron so much, but I just oh, I just it's like the fact that everyone else in the school is kind of getting angry at Harry, all the rest of it, and Ron's just like you will you hurt my best friend, you will pay the price, kind of thing. I just I don't know. I just love that. Yeah, what you said there that just makes me think of a an Order of the Phoenix quote. Yeah. <laughs> just when you know when everyone's mad at harry for all this stuff and then ron's like i'm a prefect so if you have a problem with that you can go to detention (laughs) but you guys like it's obvious now like i know i told you all that order of the phoenix was my second favorite book in our intro episode but it's probably so obvious to you guys now that it is because i have mentioned order of the phoenix more than any other book well maybe deathly hollows but order of the phoenix oh order of the phoenix Mm -hmm. best (laughs) um Damn, they have some dangerous detentions. Oh my god! Like, I, yeah. I wonder when I when I read this, I always wonder because basically, I think we all kind of know that Dumbledore has basically been knows everything that has happened so far with Harry, and he knows everything that's happened because he gave him the invisibility cloak and all that. But um, I wonder if that was kind of planned on some level. Um, in regards to Dumbledore sending them into the. Uh, well, Dumbledore's orders send them basically into the Forbidden Forest. I do think it maybe could be sort of not, not so much messing with them, but there is definitely a sense of kind of slightly whimsical sort of Dumbledore sort of hopping around going, oh, I'm going to do this kind of thing. I don't know. I think it, it does kind of tie into that, you know, slightly peculiar sort of boarding school idea of the just random stuff happening for no real reason. I might like really weird detentions. But I don't know. I, just, I wouldn't want to be a kid at Hogwarts at this time. Let's be honest. But yeah, I think it's just quite—it's quite an interesting kind of insight into kind of sort of how Hogwarts operates on a day-to-day level in regards to detention and stuff, even in, in sort of unusual cases like this. 
Yeah, definitely. I, I agree there. I also get so much satisfaction from Malfoy being such a freaking coward. He's terrified. He's so scared. He's scary. such a little douchebag in this book. It's, <laughs> it's, it's kind of... He's a little shit. He's such a little shit. And it's like, pardon my language, but um, oh, when, when he like, when we find out that he like jumped on Neville and tried to scare him, I just, oh, you just, you don't, I feel, I always feel protective of Neville on a different mm -hmm. way than I feel protective of other characters. Cause at this, at this point, he's just, he's just a little marshmallow. So it's, mm. he's a different kind of vulnerable than, than Ron is in other books. So in, in this one, I just, I, I feel, I feel so protective of him. And, and I think Harry does too. Like he says that in, I can't remember the, there's, there's one moment that he says, says something about Malfoy hurting Neville or something like he better have not gotten hurt or something. I can't remember exactly what he said in this chapter, but he says something about being worried about Neville. And so I, I, I just, I, I love that part of just, you know, everyone's kind of not, everyone's kind of mean to Neville, but they, they treat him equally. So I, I mm. like that part of it. So they go into detention, go into the Forbidden Forest. Uh, one thing I, I, I always like is I always imagine the centaurs being very elegant. Mm. In, in some manner of just like the way, the way they talk, too. And mm. I think how the, you know, it's, it's a different species, but they're somewhat humanoid species. species. Yeah. So it's, mm. you get... Yeah. J.K. Rowling is able to, like, establish um, a difference in the way they speak, which doesn't make them feel human, but there's a human aspect to them. Mm -hmm. But she, she, like, specifically establishes the way they present themselves and the way they talk, and I like that part of it. You, do, you, do, you, definitely, you definitely get the sense from this that there is some kind of history going on with the different magical races as such so there's different stuff going on that we're not privy to at this moment in time and obviously we find out later that there's you know there's been centaur rebellions and all the rest yeah. of it but at this point um all we know is that there is you know central societies that are very different from human society and they don't from the wisdom human society and that they don't always get along and i think it's quite telling the fact that there's um they refer to they refer to humans as like you know uh, like they would do to their own kind with the children, but there is sl a slight distrust of older humans. I think they, they, which which I suppose makes sense. But at this time, we don't know why, and it's only later on that we do find out that there's been ministry clampdowns and all the rest of it. But I think it it does a good job of setting up how uh, separate the centaurs are in that respect. Yeah, it's definitely very interesting. I kind of wish they'd gone more in detail about like the the uh, magical creature like relation and stuff like that because we do hear about them you're right and and we like kind of throw away lines and like history mm -hmm. and magic and stuff like that but i wish we'd learn more there's just so much there's so much interesting like lore there and so many interesting yeah. interactions and stuff in this book we there's there's so fewer like uh magical creatures like like when now that i'm thinking about it when I think about all the other books, we get introduced to so many more magical creatures in those books. Yeah. Like starting honestly just with Chamber of Secrets. Um, but it's I think I think it's the centaurs are, are interesting creatures and it's uh it's it's really not cool, that's the wrong word. I just I like the way that they were introduced and I like how they had a significant part in this chapter because friend mm -hmm. saves harry so i i like that part that we sh we were able to be introduced to these these creatures and also have them be an important part of the plot in this chapter mm -hmm. yeah i love how they come back like friends comes back and he uses div divination so there's more of those like connections later in the series mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That's really cool. Oh, As, Hagrid, Hagrid calling Malfoy an idiot is just yeah, really yeah. happy. Yeah. I love when Hagrid does stuff like I love when teachers like it doesn't happen very often, but when teachers call Malfoy out on his bullshit is mm -hmm. so amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it just makes me think of of uh, uh, Goblet of Fire. 
but it wasn't really a teacher. But anyways, um, <laughs> but whenever whenever an adult calls Malfoy out on on him being a freaking little shit, it gives me satisfaction. I mean, mm. it gives me satisfaction when anyone does that, but when an adult does it, I love it because he's like mm. my father, blah blah blah. Oh, him and his stupid father just. <sighs> <laughs> I think it's really interesting. I think H&M, you mentioned this before that this tension is like on a different level than any other tension we we would we would see later in the series. Like, mm. and I'm very curious why. Is it because like the rule they broke was just that much worse, or is it because like layered tensions are like doing lines with umbrage, which is dangerous in a different sense, but didn't really know it was dangerous at that point, or like signing envelopes with Lockhart, or like. With Snape, I think they might have had tension where they were like cleaning potions, like pots and like that. But like the other tensions mm-hmm. are very much less, or like losing Quidditch privileges or losing points. But like going into the Forbidden Forest, mm-hmm. when they know there's something dangerous out there attacking unicorns, like why is that so much worse? And these are all first years. Mm-hmm. You know, I've always thought about that. And it's, I don't know. I I feel like I feel like in this situation is probably a lot like this happened for the plot. Mm-hmm. Mm. I think it um it does to a certain extent satirize uh, a lot of British boarding schools. Like they will have, in, at least in the old days, they did used to have really weird punishments and things. Like you'd have, um, I've heard of tales of, like kids that were like put upon pegs on the like the side of walls on outdoor walls and things, and like they they sort of have to take them. They'd be up there for an hour or so and kind of thing, and like. Oh, this is like in the like seventeenth century kind of thing. Oh, it didn't happen. Oh, it hasn't happened oh, recently. Thank God. But oh, you forget how, how old some of these schools are. But like in some, you get like really weird detentions and all the rest of it, and like you know corporal punishment and all the rest of it. You know, yeah. still happening into the twentieth century. So I think it, it's it's to a certain extent like a parody of that kind of idea of like really weird detentions and just odd punishments going on i mean obviously there isn't corporal punishment going on a whole what's well until umbridge turns up but it's still kind of you know there's some weird stuff going on you know it's, it's supposed to be a bit of a, a parody of um those kind of situations and institutions sorry if i'm going a bit too british here but I no, no, that's a really interesting context <laughs> makes me think of a uh, filch himself says you know the detentions are too he talks about how he still has chains in his office. Like, yeah. <laughs> Filch, mm. Filch is one of those people where it's just like, this guy is so, like, creepy. Mm. <laughs> he's, he's, he's very creepy. And I, I always wonder, like, how he even got his job. Filch. I think he originally, probably originally was not too bad when he started, but it's like he's been at Hogwarts for goodness knows how long. And he's he doesn't have any magical powers, but he's born into the wizarding world, and he's surrounded by all these kids who can do magic constantly. And he's having to clean up. You know, it's actually pretty unfair to think about it. A guy who can't use magic is yeah. being asked to clean up this massive school with all these kids, you know, running wild and putting mud everywhere, and he's having to clean it up through no magic at all. I mean, I can cut. I don't. Uh, uh, you know, I don't sympathise with him, but I can kind of understand why he's so angry. I mean, Ron says it himself. He does. He kind of. It makes sense as to why Filch is so irritated by the students, is because it's kind of a reminder of he can't do it, kind of thing. And the students aren't so exactly nice either. Thing. The students aren't exactly nice. I mean, these are like teenagers. There's, teenagers can be a bit vindictive and petty. And like we already know the Weasley twins like do tease Filch, whether it's like warranted or not. Like they do poke fun at him. Peeves pokes fun at him. Um, mm. I always kind of imagine that the reason Filch um, had a job at Hogwarts was kind of like because of um, Dumbledore. Like we see Dumbledore gives opportunities to people who usually wouldn't have it, like with mm-hmm. Hagrid, with Lupin. And I'm guessing that the similar sort of thing happened with Filch. And this is like one of those times though when like maybe Dumbledore's good intentions did not end up going very well for the poor person who was at the mm-hmm. other end of it because Poor Filch does not have a great life. Yeah, mm-hmm. Filch is good at his job, though. Like he may, he may be kind of like mean and a little bit like cruel and creepy, but he does what he needs to do. Yeah, mm-hmm. he he makes sure that the kids, you know, don't break the rule. Well, they'll break the rules anyways. But when he when he catches them, some of the times they're worried, mm-hmm. they're scared of him. So he does yeah. he does what mm-hmm. he needs to. Do. He does. So, uh, yeah. yeah, in his own special way, he does. 
So then, then we have um, we have this scary kind of return of Voldemort, which is kind mm. of uh, yeah. So what? Watching the, the the Philosopher's Stone film when I was sort of eleven or you know ten or eleven, that bit where Voldemort, you know, as cruel as with Voldemort drinking the bloody unicorn, that terrified me. I was absolutely scared out of my wits watching that. And I think it it out of a book that is quite not jolly, but it's definitely quite whimsical most of the time. It does you do get the sense that there is dark stuff happening, but it isn't remarked upon too much and i think that's the main difference between the early books and later books is just that things become we stop skipping over the sort of dark stuff and start focusing on it more i think that's what kind of especially with in terms you know it's actually pretty messed up when thinking about bolden was literally drinking the blood of a unicorn like that's 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 quite messed up but because it's you know written in such a way it doesn't come across as too scary but it's just scary enough to make kids go Ugh. You know, it's, it's that kind of, oh, that was a bit of a change and you're glad to get out of there like the characters are. You know, you're glad that Hagrid, you know, the, um, not Hagrid, that um, Ferenc gets there in time and saves Harry and all the rest of it. And uh, yeah, I think it's just, it's, it sort of changes perspective on it kind of thing and think, oh, Voldemort is, something's going on, something could go really, really badly kind of thing. Yeah, I, I want to give a, a quote here just because it's, I feel like, the way this whole little blurb was written was really well done. So, you know, Ferenz is explaining what a unicorn blood does when you drink it. Um, and then he says, uh, Harry's like, if you're going to be cursed forever, death's better, isn't it? And then Ferenz says, it is, unless all you need is to stay alive long enough to drink something else. Something that will bring you back to full strength and power. Something that will mean you can never die. Mr. Potter, do you know what is hidden in the school at this very moment? The Philosopher's Stone, of course. The elixir of life. But I don't understand who... Can can you think... Can you think of nobody who has waited many years to return to power? Who has clung to life, awaiting their chance? It was as though an iron fist had clenched suddenly around Harry's heart. Over the rustling of the trees, he seemed to hear once more that Hagrid had told him what Hagrid had told him that night they had met. Some say he died. In my opinion, don't know if he if he had enough human left in him to die. Do you mean Harry Crow? That vault, Harry, Harry, and he's just that whole that whole part just. The way it was written of Ferenz kind of basically walking him through him him realizing what was happening, and then Harry suddenly understanding, and he's he's scared. Harry's terrified. Mm. I don't know that that whole part just kind of really stood out in my head, and I, I actually mm. remember reading this for the first time. And feeling that way too of just like even even myself, I I felt myself just feeling uneasy or nervous too for hair. Yeah, and um, I th yeah, I agree. It was really I love the way J.K. Rowling wrote, wrote this section because in the beginning, right when like H and M said, like that whole drinking the blood thing was such a weird, like horrible image, but it was like over we, the readers weren't able to focus very much because there was a whole like Harry didn't focus on it very much because he was just seeing paid and his scar and he wasn't able to see much and it was just like oh someone's drinking blood but also oh my gosh Harry's like in so much pain and oh my gosh there's like these things happening and a center jumping over him and whoa and so we don't focus on that but then later it's like wait a minute we come back to it and it's so much darker and worse it's not just any creepy vampirish thing it's Voldemort and you can see like Voldemort is desperate and he's willing to do anything to come to life, which is what as a whole another layer of dark and dangerous. It's a great way to introduce like Voldemort, the character properly into the mm. series. Yeah. We I mean we don't know anything. Like I, I always whenever I think about things like this, I always think about people who were lucky enough to read these books as they were coming out. And I always think in my head like what what were people thinking as they were reading this i wonder if anyone was suspecting quirrell and i i haven't actually asked anyone that who people who 
read the books as they were coming out and didn't have anything spoiled for them if they suspected Quirrell at all. I think it's because Snape in the Philosopher's Stone, Snape is set up very, very much as you know the suspicious too. Whereas Quirrell's kind of he's almost exclusively seen as kind of sort of vulnerable. And it, and the the kids don't really. I don't think they might, they don't really mind him. He doesn't. They don't. You know, we don't hear them complain about his lessons or anything. They just said he's quite meek and mild. So I. It's. I think it's like a red herring. A red herring idea, isn't it? That Snape is kind of seen as oh, he's definitely got to be the person doing this, and it turns out he was actually the sort of weak. You know, sort of well, not weak will, but you know, uh, sort of mild, um, meek sort of person off to the side. These two chapters are are kind of a more uh, turning point. Like in mm-hmm. in a lot of the books, in almost all the books, it's the last few chapters that like everything happens. Mm-hmm. And this one, I didn't realize that it's like literally the last three chapters because there's only like seventeen chapters to start with. But uh, this one kind of just sets up what's kind of what's 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 set to come in the next mm-hmm. two chapters, which is a lot. The more intense yeah. that, and. Do you guys think it was Dumbledore that returned the invisibility cloak, wasn't it? Oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. That's I think it's really, really interesting. Dumbledore is, I feel like Dumbledore is secretly just kind of setting up everything in this book. Because, like, yeah. he, yeah. We, 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 only, we only actually have two interactions between Dumbledore and Harry in this book. But yeah. it sets up a lot of what's to come. Because I feel like even though he only has two interactions with Harry, he's so much more part of it than we realize. Hmm. Um, I think it's uh, quite interesting in regards to sort of Dumbledore sees that Harry's got two friends. So he decides, oh, OK, well, maybe we can draw them into sort of what's going on here because they're, they're you know, they, these three are starting to do detective work and trying to figure things out. So I think, OK, I'll start to sort of maybe see if I can draw them into what's going on and maybe add a giant chessboard in here and a logic puzzle here sort of thing. I do kind of wonder whether or not a lot of this was kind of premedicated on, oh, okay, there may be a war coming, so why don't we get some people together and sort of see what's going on? Maybe I'm just uh, overthinking things, but I think that it, it does bear thinking about it. You never know. Yeah, definitely. There's also a thought in the back of your head of being like, so did, like, this is something that's been discussed then a lot that's like, is Dumb- like is Dumb- should Dumbledore be considered like a very good character? Did he like create all these traps and everything to just to test them? Like are these all tests? Is he kind of like shaping their destiny and pushing them along? He kind of knew that Harry had to sacrifice himself from pretty early on. Not this early on, but like Chamber of Secrets early on. Like there's as well as like this he's doing good things, kind of. There's that sense of like he used to care a lot about the greater good. He has that past of Grindelwald. All of his actions aren't mm. really great. So there's that sense of like, hmm, how good is Dumbledore really? I will defend Dumbledore forever. I think <laughs> he's brilliant. And I think that everything that he has done had its reasons. And I think that he always had Harry's safety in his mind and he may have he may have had like a big plan but i feel like there were reasons behind every decision that he made regardless if they may have been the right or wrong decisions he had his reasons and in the end it all it worked out and i think i'll always defend dumbledore i i i don't actually i don't actually voice this that much now that i think about it but uh, i'll always defend dumbledore because he He's played such an important role in Harry's life and his development, and we get a lot more depth to him in the later books. And even when when he's dead, we get more depth to him uh, in Deathly mm. Hallows. But uh, yeah, I mean, I won't argue that Dumbledore, in the end, like he was so important for winning the war and like creating a great future for the Wizarding world, but. Even good characters can do bad things for the wrong, like for good reasons, right? I feel like Dumbledore is the kind of character who says the end justifies the means, and there are signs throughout the books that, like, may. I mean, I feel like we can get into a long, long discussion about this, 
but there are little signs that maybe Dumbledore hasn't, like maybe Harry's life could have been better. Maybe he might not have been put in so much danger and stuff. Maybe the end result would have been worse. But there are signs that like, Dumbledore says the ends justify the means. And his means weren't always wonderful. I think in, in regards to um, Philosopher's Stone, what makes it quite interesting is that it's all to do with the framing. Like you say, we don't we don't know a lot about Dumbledore at this point. We start to learn more later on. Although he is a big, big part of this novel, he's not. He's like I say, he's only in two parts. We know a fair amount about him just on those those two things. You know, two things will later become quite clear later on, especially with the Mirror of Erisit. But what I find interesting is that it's framed very much as he's still seen as sort of this slightly kooky slightly whimsical kind of headmaster who kind of he'll sit down on the floor next to this little 11 year old and talk to him about things and I, it's you get the sense that he is definitely that but then again he there's also something else going on and i, I think harry says he he's when he's uh with the mirror of Aris in that scene he says he got the impression that dumbledore wasn't being exactly truthful with him and that's not like a bad thing at all because obviously you know yeah, he's got his reason and all the rest of it but it does kind of show you that there's it's to do with the framing of it and we will discover that later on but at the moment we're still very much looking at this through a child's eyes and thinking that this oh this this headmaster is being slightly whimsical and unusual and all the rest of it and that's what we see and uh it, it's quite interesting when we see it later on and it changes but i think that's it makes sense given what philosopher's stone is about it's a, a boarding school mystery kind of thing with little kids so yeah i think i think it it's it's a good kind of introduction to Dumbledore as a character. Yeah, I think uh, the line where where Harry says he doesn't think Dumbledore is being entirely truthful with him. I mean, it makes sense because what he actually sees is the the blood pact he does with the only person he's ever loved, who ended up being a dark wizard. So you, you feel like you can't really tell eleven year old Harry that. <laughs> Yeah, it's not something you want to really discuss with a little kid. <laughs> um, I think that wraps up those two chapters. Does anyone yeah. else have anything more to add? Might I? Just one more thing about Ron? Of course. Of course. So you you never have to ask if talking more about Ron is okay. We <laughs> could talk on and on and on about Ron, and Ron forever. I feel like mm-hmm. I feel like well, at one point we're going to do like a huge character discussion about Ron. I feel like that episode is going to be like three hours long or something. Oh, definitely, yeah. <laughs> what, what I especially like um, in this chapter is that after they get back from the detention, uh, Ron's waiting for them asleep in the common room, like he fell asleep while he was waiting. And I just think that's really sweet. But also it's kind of funny because he wakes up and when Harry shakes him awake Ron shouts something about Quidditch fouls <laughs> so he's already he's already like probably in his mind playing Quidditch like on the you know in the keeper position kind of thing I know I just think I just think that was quite nice it was Ron is definitely still a child but he's also you know he's a bit more he's a bit more rambunctious than Harry is he's a lot more sort of self-confident and it's interesting that as the series goes on that becomes less so because obviously Ron's doing all this emotional labor for his friends and all the rest of it and they clearly do appreciate it, but he doesn't, doesn't realise just how much it's kind of taking out of him. And obviously, as you know, he got years of worth of, you know, teachers ignoring him and all the rest of it. And is, let's just say I'm not exactly a big fan of the Wheezy twins in the earlier books, but I think that's, yeah. But yeah, I, 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 at this point in time, I really like the way that Ron's, the way that Ron is written, because he comes across like a genuinely just a really good friend. I think that's quite important because at this point in time, there isn't any kind of romance stuff, you know, that hasn't really happened yet. And much, you know, I love Romani, that's my thing, as you all know. But I just, at this point in time, it's just like Ron is a good friend. I just really like that, the way he's just such a good friend to Harry and Hermione. He's just there for them and just a really good person. I just think that's why people like him so much in the earlier books, is because there is so much focus given a pretty matter-of-fact focus on the fact that he is just a good person just a really nice kind person i just i just really like that i think it's quite sweet and it kind of it's a good like with a lot of philosophers Stone, it's a really good introduction to a character and i think that ron gets it especially good in at this point in time because there hasn't been that favoritism that builds up later on it's still very much three characters on a level playing field they've all got their all strengths and weaknesses and all the rest of it 
and uh, Ron's not quite as insecure at this point as he becomes later on. Like he only gets a couple of mentions, but uh, yeah, I, I just really like that little bit. I thought it was quite sweet. Yeah. So I think that wraps up this episode. Um, HM is going to join us for the last two chapters of Philosopher's Stone. We're going to discuss those two chapters and just kind of close up Philosopher's Stone. Um, and then after that, we'll do an episode where we're going to do a book to film comparison. As I've said, there will be less swearing from me in, in that episode than in other book film comparison <laughs> episodes. <laughs> But we're, it looks like we're almost done Philosopher's Stone, which is uh, oh. the end of the first book. We have many more to go, <laughs> but uh, we're, we're having a lot of fun so far, right? Yeah, yeah. so much fun. Yeah. Thank you for inviting me to this. I, I really appreciate it. This has been really great. Thank I'll, you for coming. I'll put a link to your Tumblr in the description. Oh, so lovely. anyone Thank can you very check much. out his Tumblr. It's uh, it's in. There's a link in the description. His Tumblr is pretty great. He has like, what do you have Here like, thousand followers? <laughs> um, I I think a lot of those are bots, but I I I I, I just have a lot of people who I well, I presumably um, I get along with a lot of people. I don't know why. To be completely honest, I'm a dork with a blog, but you know. You're a good writer. But, oh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, sir. So uh, we will uh, see you guys next time. Jess will be back. She She's sorry that she couldn't join us this time, but, you know, stuff happens. Um, but she will be back for the last episode. I guarantee that. And she, she says hi, by the way. <laughs> um, be prepared for a lot of chaos next episode when all four of us will be here. Oh, my God. Oh. Maybe like 500 people. Oh, that's going to be fun for me to edit. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. It's a finale episode, so we can have lots happening in the finale episode. The the finale for Philosopher's Stone. So uh, yeah. we'll we'll see you guys next episode. Erica, saying bye. Mega saying bye. Head comes more saying bye. <laughs>